The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Are you ready? Open your hearts. He that has ears to hear. You know when it says he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit's saying. It's not talking just about this ear, is it? Because there were many people that heard the message of Jesus, but it wasn't mixed with faith. They didn't hear it down here. It didn't profit them a thing. They were just words. How many saw my fair lady? Pygmalion is the way we learned it in school. Same story. She goes, words, words, words. He was trying to teach her how to speak correctly. Words, words, words. If you love me, show me. I think the Lord's speaking that to the church, don't you? Words, words, words. If you love me, show me. Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer, right? All right. I know that God's really... Uh, I know I covered some of this stuff last week and just didn't feel like it was done probably gave a little bit of an overload. If you didn't hear last week's message, you need to go back because there's probably more in there than you can drink in in one sitting. But there's some important keys. Keys in light of the times that we're living in. Keys in light of the fact that you're believers and that believers were predestined by God with a plan. And I, I get concerned because, you know, the one difficult thing about being older and being in the church for many years is you see the mistakes some of the young people are making again and again and again. It's like history repeats itself. But if they don't have ears to hear and make the correction, they're going to have to learn the hard way. Now, personally, I learned a lot of stuff the hard way. And when I learned it the hard way, you go, you don't want to do that again. And sometimes it's a good benefit. But you know, the, God's plan is not to learn the hard way. God's plan was to take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Uh-oh. By the easiest way you're willing to go. So that means he can speak a word to you and it can change your life. Then he can say, well, you didn't really hear that word, so I'm going to rebuke you and give you a stronger admonition. Change your ways. And if that doesn't work, then it's the hard way. Consequences. I can still remember the best, uh, most supernatural experience that I had as a young believer that scared me at the time, but it, 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 it calmed my spirit at the same time. I was just newly filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, all of a sudden had experiences. The first six months I was saved, I never had an experience. I just knew this is the way we're supposed to live. Pretty low-key Christianity. Six months, and if you said... What is this new life in Jesus that you found? What is it all about? And I just said, well, this is the way we were meant to live. That was the only revelation I had. No feelings, no visions, no nothing. But then after I was filled with the Holy Spirit and there was a deeper surrender, there was an immersion in Him. And I can remember grieving over even articles in the newspaper, magazine. Uh, the one that grieved me the most that I almost felt like I was going to throw up. It was a magazine in Psychology Today. It was a magazine that was laying in the, in the bookcase. And it said, uh, doctors, lawyers, and professional people of all walks of life, uh, professionals, non-professional, all walks of life are going out to the Arizona desert to get on a spaceship. They were UFO children. I don't even remember anything about that. And they're going to get on a spaceship to go to the Father's kingdom. And I almost threw up. And it was like, oh, God, how, how can anybody be that far off? Of course, once you have light in Jesus, you suddenly see how far off you were prior to, okay? But nonetheless, and I was opened up a Bible, and it was a living Bible, and the Scripture, you know, people say this kind of like uh, as an uh, expression, but it really happened. The letters came off the page, 
and were in the air, and they were full of life. And it was Hosea 3, 5. Afterwards, afterwards, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah, their King, and they will come trembling and submissive. And when I saw trembling and submissive, I even got a little nervous in a healthy way. Trembling and submissive to the Lord and His goodness. Isn't repentance supposed to lead us to His goodness? Not some kind of terror, but to His goodness and be overwhelmed by the extravagant love of God. But afterwards, so what the Lord spoke to me, even as that baby Christian, and went to the trouble of having the Scripture come off the page, that's only happened once, where it was literally in the air. Living letters. Afterwards, He's basically saying, that after they've exhausted themselves, and in some cases crash and burn. What does it take to crash and burn? I don't know. But after they crash and burn, they shall return to the Lord their God and to the Messiah their King. And they're going to come trembling and submissive, humbled and submissive, and excited about the goodness of God. So that always gave me hope, and I've never... I've never felt like when anybody tells me their sad story or what's going wrong in the family, it isn't over till it's over. So, nonetheless, I think that there is a necessity to teach on vision. And basically, the primary scripture, which I never even shared it last week, I gave that whole sermon on vision and never really had the one that, uh, that got it all going. And I don't even know where my notes are here. But it was without a vision the people perish. Haven't you all heard that? Proverbs 20. Without a vision the people perish. And if you look at the Amplified, without a redemptive revelation the people perish. Here's where I see the confusion with our young people, and if you can encourage them to watch this on Ustream or, or uh, get the CD or something, because I'll tell you what, why not go the easiest way? Why go the hard way? Why struggle? Why have your dreams crash and burn? Because your dreams were not a redemptive revelation. They were something you wanted to do, and you called it God. That is one of the saddest things that I've seen. And people promote it. Go for your dream, go for your dream. Well, I'm going for your dream, but I'll tell you what, there's a process in it to where you make sure that Jesus remains Lord in it. Because if your dream overshadows Jesus, it's going to crash and burn. Let's look at it even in a real practical way. Can you see unsaved people who have been, by the world standards, successful. I could see what they could have been in the kingdom. Can't you? Hmm? How they could have utilized the things that were given to them in gifts. But rather than perverting it and corrupting it according to the world's standards, what that gift could have been under the Lordship of Jesus. So it's not people without a dream. Because there's unsaved people that are living their dream. They set out to do something and they got it. The difference is, is the failure, and I'm praying that our young people hear this and save themselves a lot of aggravation uh, and, 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 and get rid of that trap. I'm old enough now to know that it is a trap, is you think you've got plenty of time. But the day's going to come when you look back and you're going to say, I could have made things much quicker. I wasted years. Don't waste your years. Make mistakes, everybody does. Learn from it, get up, and brush yourself off. And let God reignite that dream and that vision that is redemptive. Without a vision, the people perish. It also means without a vision, the people cast off restraint. And I see that. And that's what I always call false independence. They're proud of the fact that I don't need anybody. Remember we shared, we shared that song from the 70s that nobody knows except us older people. When I was young, I never needed anyone. But now those days are done all by myself. 
Now when I call, there's nobody around. Because you were busy being a success. Success, when you use it in terms of your dream and your vision, success can be totally selfish. Get a grip. That's the part that's missing. You can't interpret a God-sent vision for your life, a plan that He predestined before you were born with your selfishness. They don't go like this. You die to your selfishness, you lay hold of the purpose that God has for you, and success will be automatic. You'll be surprised by it. But you seek success, you lose your destiny. You seek destiny, and you find success. Destiny always includes other people. Success means I could use people to climb the ladder. Success is basically selfish. If your job as an employee is not to make Jesus Lord and to do that job as unto the Lord, and I don't care how, what a stinky old job that is, if you can't do it as unto the Lord that you're working for Him, don't expect, for God, don't expect promotion. If you own a business, if that business is more important than Jesus, I want to tell you something that's going to crash and burn. And if it doesn't crash and burn and you are financially wealthy, you will have lost your soul and gained the world. Because that can be a tactic that the enemy can do. Everyone that is, quote, blessed is not necessarily blessed. Right? There are some very successful people that don't know what to do with their lives. They're lonely. There's young people and old people in the same category. If you go back to the flesh and you do not lay hold of a, of a, a redemptive revelation, the vision of, that God's got, the dream that God's got for you, predestined, you are predestined. He has a plan, but you can walk in your own plan. You're going to basically, we hit on the retired people, we hit on the young people. Retired people, you basically just want to have fun. You know what? I Personally, I think if that's the extent of what you've gotten in your Christianity to just have fun, then you ought to just go be with Jesus. Really. Because I don't see the redemption in having fun. Young people, you think you've got plenty of time? My favorite word that I can't say right? <laughs> Entrepreneur. <laughs> That's still a tongue twister for me. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. Get a job first. <laughs> Serve somebody. Do something. I am so weary of hearing that. You're going to crash and burn someday. You got big, big dreams, but they're all about me, 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 me. Why don't you find out what God's got for you? Young people, fun is not the, the result. You are trading fun for joy and personal satisfaction, motivation, something that keeps you focused in direction and purpose in your life. I thank God that I crashed and burned in order to get saved. <laughs> I had a different job every month looking to be happy. And as soon as I could do the job, I quit the job. Because it didn't satisfy me. I'll try this. I'll try that. Then none of that worked. Well, parties, drugs. But then that didn't work. So then I think, there's something out there that will bring that kind of satisfaction, but I don't know what it is. So I, I think I read every periodical looking for the proper topic of all things. I got a magazine on everything. And then Rick, Time, Psychology Today, look, Something is going to jump out at me and say, this is you, Dennis. Go for it. Because every time I went for it, it fell apart. Or worse, I could do it. But it didn't produce nothing in me. Save yourself that aggravation and find out what God's plan for you. And then you don't interpret it. You simply serve and allow Him to develop it. And quite frankly, without a vision... The people perish. And uh, 
I can still remember what God put on my heart, and here's, here's a key. If the vision is from God, and it's a redemptive purpose for you, you will find success and happiness in it if you properly align to it. If you just pick and choose what you want to do, that's no different than the world. And they do go according to their gifts. They go according to their likes and their dislikes. They go according to what talent they have naturally. So that can be very misleading, but when it doesn't produce the satisfaction, you know, you missed it. God gave me a vision, and here's the trap for young people especially. The trap is if He gives you a vision, if there's one that you're afraid of, die. Die to it. How many, how many people do I know were afraid that if they gave their heart to Jesus, He would make them a missionary and live in squalor? Just die to that nonsense. You fail to understand the goodness of God. And if, he, and if He sent you to a place where you had to live in squalor, you would be so fulfilled, other people would wonder what's wrong with you. Because you would find personal satisfaction in God. I look, I look at Pastor Vicky, been picking on her all morning. Now she, 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 she was in Ecuador for years, swam in the Amazon, where there was fish that bite you, little piranhas. And she goes, oh, well, we just kind of stay close to the platform. Oh, well, there's alligators in that water. There's snakes that are huge. All right? And she was so cut out for it that it was like, this is, this is fine. This is good. Let me tell you about the good times and all, you know. And the struggles were like amazing testimony stories because you were cut out for it and you followed in God. It wasn't your dream, your idea. I'm so tired of hearing young people talk about their dream. Find out if it's God or not first. Just don't assume. And quite frankly... A redemptive revelation, a vision or a dream that came from God will include other people and will require other people. So that would mean you're not only in relationship with God, you need to be in proper relationship with believers. I don't care if you were called to this, to the uh, business realm or the, or the politics or whatever. I don't care. You still need to be in relationship with the body. Hmm? Because otherwise, those, those very arenas will corrupt you. So, destiny requires other people. Not to be used, but in cooperation. It, here's the way it actually works. We've tried to teach this over and over again, but I think it, sometimes it just doesn't sink in. But it's a pattern and a principle. God will take you, if He's Lord, and bring into your life. Now, it has nothing to do with what you like or don't like. Just die to that right off the bat. Do you want Jesus or not? Then you die to what you like and don't like. I don't, like, I don't do children. I don't do uh, Sunday school. I don't do singing. I don't do, whether you have the gift or not. We don't really care what you feel like. All right? God, God's basically said, die to all of that and present yourself a living sacrifice to Him. And He called that reasonable service. <laughs> Nothing special. You can't even pat yourself on the back. That's just reasonable. Now, you offer yourself to Him and present yourself to Him in such a way that he basically it's like, I have no other foundation other than Jesus. And He will bring divine appointments into your life. And what's interesting about these divine appointments, you might not like them. <laughs> he don't care. <laughs> Those divine appointments. I can still remember one of the most instrumental people in my life to move me on a new course 
of, 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 of God's vision for us, Jennifer and I, was someone that everybody wanted to choke. <laughs> when the whole church comes up to you, oh, I want to kill her, I want to just, oh, can I, can I, can I, can I, no, we're not going to kill nobody, okay? You just, <laughs> isn't that funny? That was the instrumental person. So God can bring divine appointment. He can bring, a, a, like in my case, he brought one of the meanest little drug lord type bosses in my life and had me, gave me a job from cleaning toilets to a desk job. And that desk job faced him and he looked at me. <laughs> what his headband is in there, half the time his eyes were glazed over. And God said, there's your mission field right there and he's looking right at you. Uh, now that's not who I would have picked for a boss. And I told that story last time, right? He would take an expensive watch off, smash it against he goes, that Jesus stuff of yours. I can go buy myself another watch. You, your car, I never did finish that story. Your car has got so many rust holes in it, it won't even pass Pennsylvania inspection. What's your God doing for you? And I said, you got so much money, you never bought nothing for me. I didn't have nothing for sale, but you never bought nothing for me. And he goes, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'll buy it. What do you got? I got this Bible here. It was supposed to be a free New Testament that you pass on. <laughs> but I sold it for five, ten dollars. I don't remember. Give me ten dollars for this Bible, unless you're afraid of it. One thing about people with pride, they're they're kind of easy to push the pride button, isn't it? I'm not saying that's the way to do it. I just happened that's the way I did it. <laughs> so he bought buy that Bible. I'm not afraid of it. And Next thing you know, though, I made him so nervous, he would shake facing me. He called me smiley. Couldn't stand the smiling while you're working. Nothing more irritating than somebody smiling when you're not happy. But uh, it, was, it was a good enough period of time that I came out one day, and he, had, he was the head of a, a trucking company, the, all the mechanics. Uh, that would uh, work on truck engines. It was a whole fleet of trucks. And so it was a huge, uh, a huge uh, uh, repair area that he was the head mechanic. And uh, I came out and my car was all patched up and they had painted it and patched it up for me. And when the Lord opened up another job, told me it was time to go, Another guy came in, the first question all of them guys had, are you a Christian? <laughs> we had one of those here. Are you a Christian? And the next guy said, yes, I am. And then I found out later, they told me, they took him and hung him on a hook in the Bay Area where they pull truck engines out. They hung, temporarily. They hung him on the hook. And they said, we had a Christian in here. You're not one. So... They weren't Christians, but they knew what you were supposed to act like. And see, he was smoking dope with some of the other truck drivers. So they didn't have any respect for him. He was talking out of two sides of his mouth. He was a Christian, and he, but he's smoking dope, and you know, yeah, yeah, it's okay. But without a redemptive revelation, the people cast off restraint. How do they cast off restraint? One translation says they run wild. Without a vision, they cast off restraint. What do you suppose, what kind of restraint would they cast off? They'd get too busy for church, too busy for fellowship, too busy for one another. That'd be one way to cast off restraint. And what would they do if they're casting off restraint? Call it legalism. When the Bible clearly says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And parents, what you tolerate with your little children like, you find it nothing to not assemble, to throw a party for your kids, or do this for your kids, do that for your kids. Whatever they see you do as an excuse or lax, they will take it further. Is that what you want for your children, to take it further? Your lax, and turn it into license? Or do you want to set an example? 
because a redemptive revelation will keep you focused on what God is doing. He'll bring divine appointments. And if you stay focused in a God vision, those divine appointments will become divine connections. Interesting. God can find you. And He has purposely appointed the exact time and the exact place in which you should live. So He knows who's in your neighborhood. He knows who's in your church. He knows who's on your job. If you would walk in obedience to Him, He could take divine appointments and make them divine connections. But a loose cannon, they're like tumbleweeds. They just roll around in the desert and go around and around in a circle. Divine appointments will bring divine connections, but that means divine connections, you got to know where you're at. Are you in the right place at the right time? Divine appointments become divine connections. That's when maturity starts to take place, and you actually begin to tap into a structure that is God made. There's your vision. A structure that is made. By the way, in most cases, your vision is fulfilled within the context of a larger vision. What does that break? That breaks that false independence, that lone ranger spirit, that just me and God, me and God. I'm part of the all larger body of Christ. That's all nonsense. You're part of the larger body of Christ, but if you don't know where you live, I don't know about you, but my kids ate in my house. They didn't go to a different neighbor's house every day for a meal because they were serving something better. Although I'd have let them go. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> but what do they learn? I learn that it's all about me. It's all about what I can get. It's all about me, myself, and I. It's never going to produce success from the kingdom point of view. It can be successful from a carnal point of view because you made it your God. It's actually idolatry. And what's interesting is Ezekiel 14.4. Now everybody's got that memorized, right? Ezekiel. <laughs> Write down Ezekiel 14.4 because this could, this could save your life. Ezekiel 14.4 basically says, If a person has an idol in their heart, and they come to the Lord or to the prophet with an idol in their heart, I will answer them according to the idol in their heart. Oh. What does that mean? If you've got an idol in the heart, you're going to hear prophecy. You're going to interpret dreams. You're going to interpret it based on what's in your heart. Is it Jesus primarily in your heart or what you want? Remember when we were down in Santa Rosa Beach? <laughs> they were telling a story about they prophesied to somebody God's going to give you a new marriage and he went and divorced his wife when in reality the prophetic word was to get your marriage together. But if you have an idol in your heart you will interpret even a prophetic word based on your selfishness. Based on the idol. And God will allow that to happen because He's tried to speak to you, but you already had an opinion. <laughs> and you can't hear when you're already locked into an, idol an idolatrous thing. Remember the man that was low on the totem pole in sales? Godly Christian man, but never it occurred to him, he separated the secular from the sacred. You know, church life, my Christianity is one thing, my job in sales is another thing. He was low man on the totem pole until he got a really a revelation or a, God just illuminated his mind to the fact that, you know what? This is God's business. I thought it was my business. He gave it over to God and from that time forward, he prospered. But that mindset that this is God's business 
He said, you couldn't even explain it. It was real. And I go, oh, I can explain it. I know what you're talking about. I didn't pick the vision to plant a church. That was put in me as a baby Christian. I didn't pick it. That's healthy. I didn't pick the vision. But it's the place of satisfaction. And I enjoy the journey. I enjoy my life. I found satisfaction in Him and fulfilling my destiny. And it's always included people. Divine appointments become divine connections. Divine connections, once they get established, begins to form a divine order, a structure. My first church was the same way. God would have me develop for in the building. And pastors came from all over to copy what I was doing in the building. And I'm going, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't just copy something. It was organic. It was based on who God sent, their gifts and talents, and allowing them to emerge within the context. I had four dance teams, but it wasn't because I said, mm, I think it would be really cool if we had four dance teams. Let's have four dance. Anybody know how to dance? You know. <laughs> but I had four people. One taught Hebrew worship dance. One taught ballet. One taught this, and one was creative. And one uh, had creative dance, and the other. And they were all trained. And I had an extra room in the building, and they put mirrors up, and they trained the people and have four dance teams. You don't come and copy that. Divine appointments. It was who God sent into that. Develop through divine connection, but there has to be a heart connection first, otherwise you're just promoting yourself. Heart connection produced a divine order. It was organic. Do you realize I didn't organize that? It what? Emerged. It grew naturally. That is the biblical fashion. It will grow naturally and it will surprise you, so don't interpret it because you don't know what it's going to look like. It's almost like there's a seed in there, and if you allow it to be uh, bathed in the light of God and in the soil of the heart, it will emerge first the blade, then the corn, then the full ear and the corn. Then you will say, oh, this is that. And people will think you planned it all along. Talk about walking into a compost pile and coming out smelling like a rose. Only God can do that. You didn't know what you were doing, and the sooner you admit it, the better. You were simply obedient to walk in the light that you had, one step at a time. The Lord is a lamp unto my feet. You only need to see one step of obedience afterwards, and you will be guaranteed successful. Why you would want to try any other way other than God, I have no idea. Except most of the time it's impatience because you feel like there's been a delay. And I shared that last, last week. My delay, just to show you how foolish it was. I was 19 years old, wasn't saved. 19 years old, joined the army for six years and went into a deep depression because I would be <clears throat> 25 years old. By the time I got out, I'd be an old man. Now, isn't that foolish? But there's people that think like that. Don't make those mistakes. God can take the compost pile of your mistakes and birth a beautiful garden. Some of you feel like your dream died. Give it a funeral. Really. God is so smart that if you buried that thing and you let it die, God is smart enough. He really is. Isn't that kind of an understatement? God is smart enough. You're not. God is smart enough to break forth into something you never thought of that's beautiful and satisfying. And it's not over till it's over. So if you've got a dream that you feel like just didn't make it, God can either resurrect it or you need to bury it, but dream again then, right? And find out from God's perspective what He has for you. Quit trying to make something fit because you try to put square pegs in round holes and then you get all frustrated. The main thing to understand about a redemptive vision, without a vision from God, without a redemptive revelation, without something that He has already predestined, what He has already planned, it's to an unbeliever it will sound foolish. 
to an unspiritual person. Uh-oh. Yeah, even church people, it will sound foolish. Because it's revealed by the Spirit. It's the Spirit that searches the deep things. It's the Spirit that reveals. A true vision or dream from God for you, and everybody has one. Because it was, you were pre-ordained to walk in it. I know the plans that I have for you, plans for welfare, not calamity. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. If you skip that part, then you, you're, you're left on your own and you'll concoct some idea and you'll do like I did. You change from one idea to the next. Oh, well, that didn't work. Oh, that didn't work. I'll try this. I'm young. I can keep trying all these things. It's an utter waste of time. Why not do it right from the beginning and really prosper and enjoy the journey? Because you can't get those years back and say, I wish I did it over again. That's the trap the enemy would like to get you into. That's called regret. Regret is part of me wants to do it over again. It isn't going to happen. You need a little reality. What is it you want that you're not getting? Die to that. What is it you're getting that you don't want? Die to that. You die to that and God can emerge the dream of your life that brings you the most happiness and you really don't know what it is. I'm tired of people interpreting their own dreams. Tuck it on a shelf and let God reveal it to you. Because there's always a process between the vision and the fulfillment and the person that gets the vision better be changed and transformed by the Spirit of God before the fulfillment of the vision. Somebody says, God's going to call me to pastor someday, but I don't read my Bible or pray. <laughs> I don't want to do any schooling. It's just going to fall right out of the sky. Right? And wouldn't that be ridiculous to think that? But there's people that think like that. No preparation. No obedient step. Baby steps of obedience builds the kind of spiritual authority that we need. But vision's not received by the words that we could be taught. It's, it's literally received by revelation. God has wonderful things planned for you. Say that to yourself. God's got wonderful things planned for me because the Bible says so, regardless of your opinion. He wants to reveal the deep things. He wants you to know. If you will seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. What he's looking for is someone that will search him for all his heart. And those who basically say, that's too much effort, I'm going to go take matters into my own hands and fulfill my dream. Reminds me of uh, that term. <laughs> wasn't a very good term in the 70s, helter-skelter. We all think of Charles Manson when we think of that term. But helter-skelter is basically what I see young people doing, trying to find their dream. Where God's not fickled. He's not confused. He doesn't say one thing one minute and then another thing the next minute. He's basically looking to see how you respond in your heart to being part of something bigger than yourself. You know, Satan has dreamers. He'll put a false vision in there. He hates dreamers. Why would he hate someone who has a dream and a vision that God has put in their heart? Why would he hate that? Because he has, he's been unchallenged in territorial rule. You fulfilling the purpose of God challenge his rule. So sure, he's not going to like it. And he's going to constantly tell you it's not going to happen. He's going to basically try to get you to fall into the two traps of it's delay and doubt. Maybe it's too late. Maybe I should have done. Well, well, you know, I can still remember mine. Now we've got books. It's, it's literally around the world. We're seeing people that were Christians for many years being helped. But when I was a young Christian, 
I was never outside of my local church except to change with my spiritual father. We would switch pulpits for vacation purposes. That was as far as I got out there for the first 15 years or so. And I kept saying, my battle was, God, if what you're teaching me is so important, if these 250 people, if it's that important, why don't other people hear in this? I think if Joseph could have said the same thing, huh? If that dream was you, God, how come I'm in a pit? How come my brothers are supposed to be bowing down to me? How come they just threw me in the pit? It's easy to do that. But if you hold fast to what God puts in your heart, it will transcend all of that stuff. Can you die to the doubt? Can you die to the delay? But it hasn't happened yet. I'll tell you what. I believe that God has just lifted our vision higher. He's taken something that he showed me years ago. And I believe all of a sudden now it's going to go to a whole nother level. And that's the way you should be looking at your life. The things that you've learned and acquired and the things of God, it's, God can bring it to a whole nother level. But there's some things are just going to have to be let go. What we're going to be doing, I know in this congregation, there's a new emphasis on the house groups. And so in the months ahead, we're going to be working on that more intensively because uh, uh, I, it really doesn't leave us. We've been rereading some material from Whitfield and John Wesley. And Whitfield led tens of thousands of people to the Lord and in his latter years was discouraged because many of them fell back into carnality. Just think, all the tens of thousands... And he confessed openly, he said, but our brother John Wesley did it right. What he did was, in the preaching of the word, these converts met in small groups and were accountable. And if you get paranoid over that word accountable, you need to deal with that. That's, that's a serious flaw in you. Accountability is nothing more than basically saying to one another, bringing it to the light instead of playing religion, looking like the perfect person, and simply saying, how was your Christian walk this week? You, and you confess it, I struggled in such and such an area. Let's pray that through. See, we've got the tools on how to pray it through, so we're without excuse. I don't see home groups as fellowship, spaghetti dinners. I've seen people that came together in a house group and nobody knew each other. After, after five years, they still didn't know each other because they kept it purposely superficial. That's not accountable. Accountability is basically being real. You bring it to the light and you have fellowship one with another. It's not just you. And you know what? Once you bring it to the light, you're safe. And John Wesley took England. He conquered England because of that. There were schools and hospitals. Why? Because these people didn't lose the fire that they had. Whitfield lost the fire. And he was quite successful as an evangelist. But saddened in his latter years, seeing most, the vast majority slid back. Backslid. That's a private joke between Jennifer and I. The divine connections become divine structure. Divine structure starts moving in purpose. There's your destiny. And people's destiny is in a context of a bigger group than you. My first church, God said, you did beautiful, Dennis. You had people come from miles around, other pastors. One guy even did his doctoral thesis on my first church. He says, most are enablers. You know what enablers are? Hold your hand, tell you you're okay. Don't, don't talk about sin because we'll get people upset. We don't want to upset anybody. Hand holders, if you need something, the pastor will do it for you. Bless God, our pastor made 675 house calls this week. That's old school. I don't make house calls. I don't call you. I don't chase people. If you have relationship, it should be to where you inquire. 
Now, I said, God, what did I do that he said that? That out of 70 pastors, I was an equipper and possibly one other, which was my spiritual father, possibly. And I said, what did I do? I'm not so great. What did I do different? And he basically says, you equipped by teaching them to stand on their own two feet, and you equipped them in the building. The building looked like a circus with flags, four dance teams, four worship teams, everything. Everybody was trained for in the building. Now, is that bad? No. But God told me when I came here to Charlotte, you start another church, you do the same thing you did there, but you put the emphasis not in the building. You put the emphasis where they spend 98% of their time, and you know how to do it. And so what that is, is I don't hold your hand, I don't baby you, I don't counsel you. I will give you the tools and give you homework. If you don't do your homework, don't call me again with another problem. That's equipping. And they go, I don't like that. Well, how many kids when you went to school, you wanted, you wanted to have the mommy give you a sandwich and your lunch and pack it just the way you like it. But then you had the nerve to go to school and somebody gave you a test and a quiz. The audacity. But that's the development. There's love and tenderness, and there's feeding, but there's also, now, let's show me what you've learned. And what John Wesley did was with the small groups, show me what you've learned. You want to hear something really strange? I don't, I don't think we could do this. It would be fun to do this. We'd probably have, we'd, me and Jennifer would be here for sure. But if you didn't go to the small group, you didn't get a ticket to come on Sunday. Am I right, Jennifer? <laughs> but you know, in other words, you don't merit to worship with the people that are sold out to God. But it took England. Well, I could hear now. That's legalism. That's legalism. Man, would I love, would you like to worship with those people? Were they perfect? Absolutely not. But you know what they were? They would bring their junk to the light and deal with it. So the group was not spaghetti dinner, fellowship, ha-ha, rah-rah, fun. You can have that. But in reality, it was, I'm holding, we're holding each other accountable to walk the walk. I didn't do so good this week, but nobody, no condemnation. Just, well, then what are you going to do? Once you bring it to the light, you know what? The devil can't condemn you with something that you already talked about. That's what's beautiful about confession and the testimony. You can't, what can you do to someone who's already said it? <laughs> Say, thank God that's not me. Then you'll have to deal with that. <laughs> I've seen that in men's groups. They get together, men get together. It's not, it's not always healthy. These men get together and they go, thank God I'm not as bad as Ralph there. He shared his problems. That's not the goal. <laughs> the goal is not that you're better than or thank God I'm not as bad as Ralph. The point is, is that Ralph is sharing his heart. You take respond. You who are spiritual, show them how to be restored. Show them how to deal with it properly. So we've got those tools. But I think now we need to implement it. Next Sunday, if you don't have a ticket, <laughs> okay. if you're watching by Ustream, you have to turn your television or your computer off if you didn't go to, if you didn't confess your faults one to another. All right. How many are interested in house group? That's almost everybody. And that's where you build the best relationships. So in, the, in the, the months ahead, we're going to be training some leaders and opening up some house groups. But remember, it's not to just come and be babied. You can be loved. But it's going to be the opposite of see if I can get a big crowd by never talking about sin, just tell you you're okay, everything's wonderful. The best counsel you get is stop it. <laughs> you could get that anywhere. Just stop it. That was Bob Newhart's strategy, remember? For five dollars, he would counsel anybody. A person would come in and say, I have, this, I, have this fear of, I have this fear of being confined in a box and I don't want it. And he goes, stop it. That'll be $5. <laughs> well, you don't understand. I, I still have it. All right. That'll be another $5. Stop it. And, but it's still it's not working. It's not working. 
okay, look, stop it or I'm going to put you in a box and confine you in a box. <laughs> Is that almost what we have to do sometimes? Well, let's let God set us free today. Without a vision, the people cast off restraint. When they're casting off the restraint, it's not that they're not busy. You say, how's it going? They go, oh, I'm getting there. Ask them the next time they say that, where's there? Because if they're aimless, they really don't know. Where's there? But I want to pray, and especially those watching by Ustream, I want to pray. You don't know whether or not it's retrievable. There's some things that God put on your heart when you were very young, and maybe it's too late for that. But God has a way, in His wisdom, to give you a new dream. And it may even be an interpretation of an old dream that you thought was too late. But first of all, let's let it go. Father, right now I'm going to take all my mistakes, all the things that I felt like I should have done years ago. Oh, if you saw how many people I prayed with that said, well, I'll go on the mission field after my kids are grown, and then never did. All right, let it go. If that's you, that one's really coming to the surface right now. You said you were going to go on the mission field after the kids were grown, but now the kids are grown and you're not doing it and getting guilty. God's saying, let it go. Let it go. I prayed with a, with, a, with a man who ended up teaching driving lessons, and people from every country around the world came to him, and he got to witness to them. You have no idea in the wisdom of God how he can fix it. So just die to it. Lord, if I've got dreams that crashed and burned, I, I just let it go. I release it to you. I release those dreams and those visions to you. And I believe in your infinite wisdom that you can bring beauty out of those ashes. You can resurrect and give me a new dream, a new sense of purpose, a new sense of belonging, a new sense of passion and focus. And those are the things that are going to keep me going for the days ahead. And guess what? If I just do what you are calling me to do, success will automatically be included in it as a byproduct. It will not be the prime objective. If success is your prime objective, then you're in idolatry. If the, if the purposes of God are the primary, success will be there automatically. So Father, we're going to have successful people in this day and age, and they're going to basically die to those former dreams and let God resurrect something, beauty, out of the ashes. The oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness and depression and the, the sense of loss. It's almost like you need to give it a funeral, bury it, release it back to God. It was His in the first place. And if it wasn't His, it still needs to die, doesn't it? If it was just your dream, because God wants to use your gifts and your talents, but He wants to put, knit it together. The Lord says, I will build my church, not you. I will build my church, and you are the church. Let Him be the initiator. And He will use your gifts and talents in a productive way. So, Father, raise up out of the ashes for these people the promises. There's no greater sense of accomplishment anywhere than the fulfillment of a God-given vision. And God predestines you. Remember from last week, the predestines? There's only four predestines in the Bible. Whom He predestined, He called to having a trust relationship. Trust God relationship. Whom He predestined, He foreknew. He predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son. He wants character change on the inside of you. He doesn't care about fulfilling your dream without the character development. The person who receives the vision fulfillment needs to be a different person than the one that received it initially. You can't stay a baby and expect to fulfill your vision. The third one is having predestined us to the adoption as sons. What's a better word? We were just looking at this in a 
predestined for sonship. That is different than the, our word adoption. Like people get confused with adoption. Adoption in the Bible was you're, you're a full, mature adult ready to take over the father's business. That's not adoption like you adopt a baby. You were predestined to sonship. You were predestined to grow up. You were predestined to be an adult. No adult adolescent will ever see the vision fulfilled in their life. They will run helter-skelter trying to make things happen. What's an adult adolescent? That's a falsely independent person that doesn't need anybody because they don't understand what I've got to do. I've got a job cut out for me. I have to work hard. I have to have fun. My favorite one is I, I can't go to church on Sunday because I stayed out late Saturday night having fun. You shouldn't even tell that to the pastor. You should be embarrassed. <laughs> but I have them tell me that. I was too tired. And if you're working that hard that you can forsake the assembling of yourselves together, you're probably borderline in, adult, in idolatry, adultery. Yeah, spiritual adultery and idolatry. Because then the job is no longer under God. Chick-fil-A learned that rule, and I think they're being blessed for it, don't you? Yes. What are they doing different? Oh, they're going against the system. And don't, and don't be surprised if they don't like you. They didn't like Jesus, why should they like you? But on the other hand, most people, Christians, even in business, would be afraid not to work on Sunday for fear they won't make enough money. Oh, I get time and a half on Sunday. Oh, I get double time on Sunday. I can't go to church. Right? Well, I bet you, I bet you John Wesley's people didn't complain about legalism. At least not to uh, Whitfield either, who grieved over all of his converts backsliding because there was no accountability. There was no relationship. I want you to memorize those principles because it's, it's the way life grows. It's just like seed, blade, corn, folk, ear in the corn. It's an organic process of spirit. And that is divine appointments are in your life. God planned it that way. He placed people in your life, whether you like them or not. There's certain people in your life and they're there. Ask God why they're there. Some people are going, why are they there? <laughs> you know, but still, nonetheless, even if it's just to see what's in your heart, to get rid of it. Jennifer told me that slow person on the road was set by God for me to let me see what was in my heart. That's healthy. Divine appointments become supernatural divine connections. Divine connections. Isn't that interesting? that I had this passion to fulfill a vision that I didn't ask for. See, some of your dreams, you ask for them based on your likes. I didn't picture, oh, now that I'm a Christian, I can't wait to start a church. Now, if I come to church and I'm all dressed up with a suit and tie, hoping the, uh, the, the, the pastor is going to let me preach, I'd call that an agenda. Hmm? If I want to be singled out, where's my niche? Come on, you people do this. Where do I fit? That's insecurity. Why not say, where do I belong? Get me planted and let it emerge instead of trying to figure it out. I have people that will visit one time to get counseling because they heard. I'm not impressed by that. That looks selfish to me. Would we use people for our own agenda? You don't hear this in a seeker-friendly church, do you? Is it true, though? If people are going to be healthy, you've got to die to your agenda 
and get on with the redemptive plan that God has for your life because that's where you're going to be the happiest. And it would be, I would not be able to live with myself not saying that. You don't have to do it. But I can't live with myself not putting it out there saying, I've seen this shipwreck enough people. I'm not going to try to just be nice and skip the subject. You know why? Because I've known two pastors large congregations who go home and cry over the condition of their church but they won't address the issues. I am not impressed with that. I'd rather kick them all out and have told them the truth than to go home and cry because of the, of the uh, rampant sexual immorality that's going on in the church but I won't address it from the pulpit. Do you see something wrong with that? I do. But ultimately, the bottom line is I want your dream to come to pass, but you can't sidestep Jesus and expect your dream to come to pass. And this entrepreneur, everyone that's in their 30s, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm going to get a job first, all right? Before you're a CEO, you get caught up in some pyramid scheme, I want the best for you, but the best is in God first. And if he's not in control of it, I don't care if you're successful. There's plenty of unsaved people that are successful, aren't there? And they can gain the whole world and lose their soul. I don't, want, I don't want your dream to rob you of your soul. Right? So, Father, we pray right now. We release all the demands and expectations on our dreams to come through our way and now we're asking God to open up open up the windows of heaven and bring what I believe he's saying to Kingdom Life Church especially and the full stature ministries I'm raising the vision to a higher dimension now and in the days ahead you're going to see it flourish because it's 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 about to sprout that we're right now in a season of sprouting just like it is springtime approaching summer we're going to see it sprout and there's going to be gifts and talents that have been dormant within you in the days ahead. And we're going to be, uh, even uh, uh, eventually Patty and Phil, we're going to be sending them out. And basically they've got a vision for what God's taught them. Uh, and they'll be going out of state and we're going to send them off with blessing. That's the proper way. Right? You want to see it flourish. There's a time and a season for trans to transmit the gifting that God's got for you. So Father, we just believe that they're going to take what they've learned with us, from us, with them, and what they've learned even with the 50 plus, and take that and be a benefit to people no matter where they go. And multiply, multiply. You see, the purpose that you were predestined was to reproduce according to kind. But what kind are you? Selfish? We don't need to reproduce that. But if you had something legitimately good in God happen to you, reproduce it. That is your fulfillment. You don't retire. You reproduce anything that's good in you. Reproduce it into an advancement of the kingdom. We've got a person that just uh, emailed Jason's pretty much and started the, the school. And we've got like, what, 40-some countries now? And I don't know how many constant emails of stuff. We have a blind man that is being totally fulfilled by this school because it's audibly, the online school is good audibly. And he's getting so much out of it. He just basically keeps uh, singing the praises of what he's learning and how he's healing his own heart of things that he's had for a long period of time. I'm telling you, there's reproduce, reproduce. The fourth predestined is not just, remember predestined to a relationship, predestined to be conformed to the image of God, the love character, predestined to grow up, adoption of sons, maturity. You are predestined to mature, but you are predestined for purpose. Predestined according to the purpose of Him. Who's Him? God. Pre, you are predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1.11.
but that means you, repro you can't reproduce something that's not yours. So you reproduce according to kind. If you stay an infant or an adolescent, the best you can do is reproduce. That's what, that's what the Apostle Paul said, though you have 10,000 boy leaders, instructors, but that's boy leaders. Though you have 10,000 boy leaders, you don't have many fathers. You need to mature, adopted of sons. You are predestined to mature. Don't be proud of the fact that you're still a baby. It's real cute when a baby spits up, isn't it? Isn't it cute? You ever see a and you go, ah, 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 cute. Now, if you were 50 years old, you did that. Nobody's going to think it's cute, right? It's going to be offensive. So grow up. Seal this work. Your dreams are going to come true, but it's going to require dying to your flesh and the idolatry of your dream. How many have died to the idolatry of their dream? If not, come back next week and we'll kill it again. <laughs> the idolatry of your dream, not the dream. You die to the idolatry of the dream and let God resurrect it because it may not be the way you thought it was going to be in your flesh. Okay? So, Father, we thank you that this is going to be a season of resurrection and a season of sprouting. And the things that we've died to, you, you and you alone have the wisdom to resurrect it. In Jesus' name. You believe that? Now, let me, I want to finish with one statement by Thomas Sowell. And uh, how many have ever heard of him? Thomas Sowell? Okay. Two people. <laughs> That's okay. Anyway. He made a statement, and I'm adjusting it a little bit. He basically said, intellect, and he was an intellect, minus judgment equals foolishness. I'm saying, intellect minus wisdom is foolishness from a Bible connection. Do you know when the Bible calls somebody a fool? It has nothing to do with their intellect. A Bible fool is a self-confident rebel. Repeat that back to me. A fool is a self-confident rebel. So intellect minus wisdom is foolishness. Intellect plus wisdom, whoa, it's understanding in the kingdom of God. Thomas knew what he was talking about, didn't he? Do you see that it's not a matter of intelligence? And you can, be a, you can be a very smart fool. The fool said in his heart, there is no God. That's all intellectual levels. It has nothing to do with smarts. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. A self-confident rebel. If there's anything I want to see the Spirit of God deal in Kingdom Life Church is to kill in us the self-confidence to where we lean back on the God confidence that He is smart enough and wise enough to resurrect the dreams in our heart and bring us satisfying, fulfilling lives. That's what we're going to believe. Amen? Amen. Are you sure? Yeah. I'll keep going. <laughs> All right. Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit this day. And we'll continue on vision if it's necessary. But I thank you, God, that you're smart enough to resurrect in us the ability to bring beauty out of ashes. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. 
Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.